What do you think about those songs? Those may be songs that the lyrics mean a lot to you, but I want to say right now, those are songs that Jacob picked out because they are his heart's songs. And I just want to t stop and t thank God for his faithfulness right now in prayer. Father, we thank you and praise you for you are supreme. Your ways are perfect and true. Lord, break us, mold us, make us your own. Pierce our hearts. Change our minds, change our way of thinking so that our hearts are focused on you. So that we can see in your love letter, in your word, that Jesus sums up that all of the laws, all of the, the prophets proclaim this word, that you loved us first and therefore we can love and that we should love you, praise you, serve you with all of our body, heart, soul, and strength. We thank you for your faithfulness, even when we're unfaithful. We thank you and praise you for the time that we can share your word, and we just give you glory and honor. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So we had a ministerial meeting this weekend, and sometimes your heart's just not in the right place. I'll just be honest. Went to the ministerial meeting this weekend and I was kind of frustrated because sometimes there's some good attendance, sometimes there's not, but there's just not that heart that I just talked about it seems to be there from the shepherds that are leading the sheep. And that's, I'm not any better than you. I'm one of just called by God to do this. But I get frustrated in things and my son goes with me and he gets frustrated. So we went to the ministerial meeting with a poor attitude, a poor spirit. Because we didn't know what was going to happen with this Thanksgiving dinner and we really need your support, your prayers, any way you can serve. Because it's only three weeks from today. But see what happened prior to that is we had very little commitment, very little talk about it. So we were talking about possibly canceling the Thanksgiving dinner. And there was talk about possibly canceling the Christmas baskets. And that had me in a poor spirit, in a poor mindset. But then I got to hear a sermon from an unlikely preacher <laughs> they just spoke his heart and he wasn't a normal pastor I'll just say that and he said uh, maybe I shouldn't say this and I'm, these are my words not exactly here's a paraphrasing but I think that would be wrong to cancel I think especially this late in the game and with what I try to teach the people around me is that we're supposed to serve one another we're supposed to love one another isn't that walking by faith <laughs> that we take on these things? And I'm going to read some Bible verses because this is what I got from that sermon even though he didn't quote scripture. James 1.18 says, He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Dropping down to verse 22, it says, Do not merely listen to the words and so deceive yourself, but do what it says. Dropping down to verse 26, it says, Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Verse 27 says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. We talked about continuing community worship services but not taking care of our community. And that's what had my heart troubled. We decided to, and, and we're going to have to walk by faith, especially in the last minutes. In James chapter 2, verse 14 through 19 says this, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by actions, is dead. Not withered, not deteriorating, it's dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good, even the demons believe that and shudder. Well, I am thankful for hearing that message even though those verses weren't there. That's what the Spirit brought to my attention because it renewed my spirit. It renewed my faith. It renewed my son's faith. 
And as a result, he came home that night and he spent time in prayer. And he spent a sleepless night, <laughs> like I have so many nights. So he decided to get up and write it down on paper. So I have the privilege and honor to sit down today and watch my son give this message today. What a blessing for a father to be able to do that. So, Sherry, if you would like to read scripture for Jacob, and then if you would like to pin this on him, I'm stepping down for today. I'd stay it up, put stuff on paper, wrote a sermon. Like, when are you going to preach it? And I said, Sunday. He's like, what? <laughs> so, yeah. <coughs> Today I'm going to talk about four parables. I'm going to start in Matthew 25, if you want to turn there for reference. Verse 1 starts off with, what version did we have up there? NLT. We had NLT, so it starts with the word then. Because of the dad, I know that when a verse starts with the word then, it means we have to go back and read the previous passage. And that's why I chose Matthew 24, 45 through 51 for today's scripture reading. I'm not going to go deep into those verses, but I want you to think about verses 45 through 47 as we start going through the parables. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give, him their, to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. For further context, the first three parables I'm going to talk about are the last parables Matthew records. Jesus knows that he's about to die. In these three parables, Jesus is encouraging the disciples that the day is coming when he will return. But when he returns, he will not be coming back, or when he returns, he will be coming back as the judge of all men. And because of that, they need to be ready. We need to be ready. The first parable is found in verses 1 through 13. It is about ten virgins who are supposed to be part of a marriage party. The problem is, they don't know when the groom will arrive. They just have to wait until he comes to get them. Five of them are smart, so they fill their lamps with oil, and they bring extra oil so that whenever he comes, they will be ready. However, five are foolish, and they only bring the lamps and however much oil was in them. They were unprepared, and sure enough, the master was delayed and came late in the night. When they hear him coming, the foolish women beg the wise women for some of their oil, the wise women refuse because they do not know how much oil they will need, and if, they were going, and if they were to give away their oil, they may not have enough for themselves. The foolish women run off to retrieve more oil, and while they are gone, the groom comes, he takes the ones who are ready, they go to the wedding party, and they shut the doors behind them. The foolish women then make their way to the banquet. They found the doors locked, and so they beg to come in. The bridegroom replies, Believe me, I do not know you. This is where you may say, but they came back. Isn't that enough? No, it's not. They were not fully prepared. They were not fully committed. Going to the banquet was not their number one priority. Because of this, they weren't let in. The parable ends with a warning. Keep watch, because you do not know the time or the hour. The point is that Jesus is coming back, and he wants us to be ready. But you might ask, what does it look like to be ready? And that's what the second parable is for. And as Jesus is teaching them success, or sequentially, the second parable explains, it tells a man of a man who leaves to go on a journey, 
Before leaving, he entrusts a certain amount of talents to each of his three servants. In this case, a talent isn't what you're probably thinking. It doesn't mean you're good at sewing or cooking or preaching. A talent is a measure of weight. And from my research, it was somewhere around 75 pounds. A talent in this case would most likely, would most likely have been a 75 pound sum of gold or silver. One servant receives five talents, another servant received two talents, and the last he gives one talent. So they were dealing with a substantial amount of money. The Greek word used here for entrust is paradidomi, which meant to give over into one's power to take care of or manage. Their instructions were to manage the money, to invest it and turn a profit. The first servant does just that. When the master returned from his journey, the servant had doubled his money. The master replies, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I'll give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The second servant also invested the money he was given, and he too doubled his master's money. The master again replies, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling the same, this small amount, so now I'll give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The NIV takes it a step further and says, for the last part of the verse where it says, let's celebrate together, it says, come and share in your master's happiness. But, complete opposite of the first two, right, Dad? That's right. <laughs> the third servant took the talent that was entrusted to him and buried it in the ground to hide it. Because of this, the, because of this the master replies, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I had harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Jesus finishes the parable by, parable by saying to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Ironically, hey dad, used a few of your things, now all I have to do is talk about my prostate and we'll be golden. <laughs> For those of you who don't come here regularly, Dad says, tries to say prostrate all the time and says prostate on accident. So I've told him to start saying face down, it works a lot better. So, Thank you, <laughs> ironically, we can read this verse and take talent as the way we know it, our skills. It's a, what did we say the word was? What? Homonym? Okay. God entrusted each of us with talents. The question is, will you use the talents you were given and double them, or will you hide your God-given talent until he returns? You see, the first two examples took what God had given them, whether monetary, in skills, or in time, and impacted the world around them and further expanded the master's, king master's kingdom. The third servant took what was entrusted to him and hid it away. He still had it, but he didn't use it to further his master's kingdom. Personally, I'm going to take what God gave me and use it to further his kingdom. Will you? To really dumb it down, look at it this way. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. If he was watching your life, would he say, Dad, look, I suffered and died a death on a cross so that he could do that with the gifts that we gave him. Or would he say, Dad, look, I suffered and died a death on a cross so that he could do that with the gifts that we gave him. Same worded, but completely different meaning. You will be held responsible for how you use the talents that God has given you. There are only two options. You can use your talents and he will say, well done, or you can hide your talents and he will say, you wicked and lazy servant. But you still might be asking, what does this look like in action? What does it actually look like to invest your talents for the kingdom? Well, that's why Jesus tells the third parable. In this parable, Jesus gets at the essence of what it means to be his follower in this day and age. How do you define being a Christian? Please don't say I go to church on Sunday and I try to be good the rest of the week. So many Christians still cling to the idea that being good is going to get them to heaven. It's ridiculous. When Jesus called us to be his followers, he didn't call us just to read the Bible, attend church, and avoid big sins. Some of us don't even do that on a regular basis. Jesus, Jesus called us into a passionate, wholehearted life of discipleship. The third ex parable explains how Jesus defines a Christian. It is a combination of the first two parables. It shows us what it looks like to live with our lamps trimmed and what it looks like to invest our talents in a way that pleases God. This parable is a foretelling of when Jesus returns. It shows Jesus in a place of authority, authority over heaven and hell and who goes where. Verse 31. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. 
All the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to, the one, to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it for me. Then the king will, return, will turn to those on the left and say, Away with you, you cursed ones, and to the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked, and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth, when you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you are refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. In all of these parables, we see that we are all given opportunities throughout our lives to further his kingdom. You have a choice, but will you choose to be a wise maiden or a foolish maiden, a good and faithful servant or a wicked lazy servant, a sheep or a goat? In each of the parables, we see the reward given to the wise and faithful servants and the consequences that befall the foolish, wicked, and lazy servants. Don't get confused. Jesus is talking about more than just a loss of reward. He is talking about heaven and hell. To the foolish maidens, he said, believe me, I don't know you. To the unfaithful servant, he said, you wicked and lazy servant, and told the other servants to throw this useless servant into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the goats, he says, depart from me, you are cursed, and to the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So I'll ask again, what does being a Christian mean to you? If you say, I believe in God, congratulations, you're on par with the demons. If you say, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, once again, congratulations, you have demonic faith. James 2.19 in the NLT says, you say, by, you say you have faith, for you believe there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tr tremble in terror. To be a Christian means to fully surrender to God's will. Belief without full surrender to God is demonic faith, and those with demonic faith will have a demon's fate. What's the difference between those going to heaven and those going to hell in these parables? In the parable of the sheep and goats, we see it had little to do with what they believed. The goats believed. The only difference between the sheep and goats was what they did or did not do. It had to do with whether or not they were actively engaged in the mission of God and specifically towards the needy. I know all this sounds like a contradiction to the whole concept of the gospel, that by faith alone are we saved, and that is true. Faith in Jesus alone will save us. But what this is teaching is that real faith, the kind of faith that will save you, is more than just a head knowledge. And let's call head knowledge what it is. It's demonic faith. Saving faith or heart knowledge will transform you and give you a desire to engage yourself in the mission of God. James 2.17 in the NLT says, So you see, by faith, or faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. This is a verse that's quoted a lot, but I don't know how many people can quote the previous two verses. Ironically, James 2.15 and 16 says, Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, Goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see... Faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. To not have works is to be a lukewarm Christian. And if that term is new to you, it's a term that Jesus uses in Revelation 3.16. It reads, But since you, are lukewarm, since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. To be lukewarm is to neither be hot nor cold. Some people like hot coffee. I prefer iced coffee. But lukewarm coffee is gross. Lukewarm Christians are Christians who go to church, believe the message, but are not really sold out to Jesus and are not engaged in furthering Jesus' kingdom. Lukewarm Christians are gross. They make Jesus nauseous and he will spit them out of his mouth. 
Jesus is talking about lukewarm Christians in these parables. The maidens considered themselves to be friends of the groom, but they did not live a life submitted to him and fervently awaiting his call. They were lukewarm. The wicked servant considers himself to be an employee of his master, but he never considered why his master gave him the talents, treasures, and time. He was given the talents so he could work, so he could work to further his master's kingdom. He was wicked because he did not invest his talent in furthering God's kingdom. He was lukewarm. And the goats were not meaningfully engaged in the mission of God. They did not use their resources to provide for those in need. They were lukewarm. Lukewarm Christians rarely sh share their faith with their neighbors, co-workers, or friends. They love when other people do. They even encourage them to do, too. But they don't do it themselves. They are more worried about having an awkward conversation with a friend than they are considered about where that person will spend eternity. Lukewarm Christians think about life on earth much more often than eternity in heaven. They spend more time contemplating vacations, going hunting, or fishing trips more than they consider what heaven will be like. Lukewarm Christians do not live by faith. Their lives are structured so they never have to. They never leave their comfort zones. Lukewarm Christians give God the leftovers, not their first and best. They give out of their excess, not their necessities. Lukewarm Christians are those that would give an old holy shirt or pair of shoes to someone in need and call it charitable. It isn't charity. If you hadn't given that shirt to someone in need, it would have gone to the dump. In Malachi, we read of a group of priests who gave to God, but they keep, kept the spotless animals for themselves and sacrificed the less desirable animals to God. They assumed God was pleased because at least they sacrificed something, but God described what they did as evil. Lukewarm Christians love God but not with all their heart, soul, and strength. To sum it up, lukewarm Christians don't really want to be saved from their sin. They want only to be saved from the penalty of their sin. Jesus is useful for keeping them out of hell, but they're not interested in really following Jesus and what is involved in doing so. And something bothered me while I was reading the parables. I realized that there is no middle ground. They were either wise and faithful or foolish and wicked. They were either going to hell, heaven, or hell. That puts lukewarm Christians in a very precarious situation, a situation I wouldn't want to be in. An old Scottish pastor named Robert Murray Machane once said this to his congregation, I am concerned for the poor, but more for you. I know what Christ will say to you in the great day. I fear there are many hearing me who may know well that they are not Christians because they do not love to give. To give largely and liberally, not grudgingly at all, requires a new heart. An old heart would rather part with its lifeblood than its money. Oh, my friends, enjoy your money. Make the most of it. Give none away. Enjoy it quickly, for I can tell you, you will be beggars throughout eternity. The fourth parable I'm going to talk about is found in Luke 14. I'm going to start in verse 12. This isn't the parable, but it's going to work into it. Then he turned to his host. When you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he said, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Jesus is talking about helping the poor again. He isn't saying it's bad to have friends and family over for dinner, but he wants you to realize that you have excess, and with your excess, you can and you should help the poor. If you do, you will be blessed. They can't repay you, but Jesus reassures you that God will pick up their tab. Now for the parable. A man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. In that time, they would announce banquets months in advance. The host would, give his R would get his RSVPs, and then he would begin to plan. When the banquet had been prepared, he sent out his servant to tell the guests the banquet was ready. One by one, all of the people he had invited and who had originally accepted the invitation began to make excuses as to why they could not come. And on top of that, there were lame excuses. The first man said he just bought a field and he needed to go see it. So he bought a field and he needed to go see it. Did he buy a field without looking at it first? And why couldn't it wait till tomorrow to go see it? It's a lame excuse. The second man said he just bought five yoke of oxen and he had to go try them out. And that day a yoke of oxen cost roughly a half year's wage. He bought five yoke, two and a half years wage. So you're telling me he spent two and a half years wages without first trying out the oxen. Lame excuse. The third man said, I just got married, so I can't come. Ladies, can you help me out? If you're invited to a fancy dinner where you get to get all dolled up and go and have people look at you and everything, 
Would you say no? And secondly, I know what it's like when you're first starting off in marriage. You take every free meal you can get. <laughs> so, lame excuse. The servant returned and, is, and told his master what they had said. The master became furious and told the servant to go out into the city streets and alleys and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. After the servant had done this, he told his master there was still room for more. So his master said, Go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come, so that my house will be full. For none of those I first invited will, even, will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. In the parable of the virgins, we see that as Christians we need to be ready and anxiously waiting for when God calls us, no matter the time or what we have to do. In the parable of the talents, we are told that as Christians, we should use our God-given talents to further his kingdom. In the parable of the sheep and goats, we are told to seize every opportunity to help the poor and further his kingdom. And in the last parable, we are told to invite everyone we see to join us. With all that said, I'm going to give you an example of some ways that I use my talents, and I'm going to ask you to join me in my efforts. So three years ago, I started showing up at the Community Ministerial Association meetings with Dad. I enjoyed it, got to hang out with local pastors, and got to know them, but I never really got anything out of the meetings besides hanging out. After about four months, we started talking about Thanksgiving and Christmas activities. Up until this point, the Ministerial Association had always given out roughly 100 baskets for both holidays, Christmas and Thanksgiving. That year, they decided that because of a lack of funding, they would only do one or the other, not both. I was frustrated with this, so I took it upon myself to come up with a different answer than just stopping. I had the idea that instead of purchasing food and giving it to people that may not even have a stove so they couldn't cook, that we should instead have a community dinner, a giant potluck. This wouldn't cost anything to the churches. It would just cost some individuals a little time and a little money. The pastors agreed it was a good idea and asked who would like to head it up. After some awkward silence, I volunteered. <laughs> the annual Thanksgiving dinner was born. We fed hundreds of people. We purchased tracks, and I handed them out to every person that walked in while I was wearing my turkey costume. I handed out over 700 tracks that day. We had another Thanksgiving dinner last year and fed and witnessed roughly 500. But shortly before this Thanksgiving dinner, the Ministerial Association was talking about Christmas baskets, and there was a discussion of dis discontinuing them because of a lack of funding and no one to head it up. Against the advice of many, Michaela and I decided to take on this burden also. They were afraid we would get burned out having, to, having the Thanksgiving dinner, Christmas food baskets. She was pregnant with Isaac. We had Kira, and Mom and Dad were gone to Hawaii again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we knew God would provide us with the rest we needed and the resources that we needed but we still had the problem of funding we took to finding sponsors we found enough people willing to donate that it didn't cost the association anything even though they were worried about the money we handed out over 120 boxes that had personalized Christmas cards in each one and we did the same thing at Easter we invited every person that received food at these events to church I don't know if any have responded to the invitation, but I don't get discouraged. I know that I'm doing wh what I'm supposed to, what I have to do with my talents, and I know I'll be rewarded for it when I get to heaven. Even if my reward is simply, well done, my good and faithful servant, it will be worth it. I don't want you to think I'm boasting or pointing fingers, so I'll expose myself for a minute. I help Dad respond to ministerial calls from time to time, and last year, between the time of doing the Thanksgiving dinner and passing out the baskets, someone called that I've heard the name several times, so because of that, I didn't want to help the person. Dad was out of town, so I didn't have access to the ministerial bank account, and he asked me to go get food out of my pantry to give to her. Dad asked me to. Michaela wanted me to, but I didn't want to. Michaela got food from the house and brought it to our shop for the lady to pick up, but she never came to get it. Michaela's heart was right, but mine was not. This was while we were living with Mom and Dad because our house had flooded. I went back to the house a week later and found that mice had gotten into everything in the pantry that she didn't take. If I had only done what Dad had asked me to do and what Michaela had prompted me to do, then all of that food wouldn't have gone to waste. And we had to deal with mice up until a couple months ago when I finally got rid of them. So my disobedience had consequences, but from those consequences, God also gave me a more generous heart. Back to the message. When we do all of these things to help people, they may begin to ask why. Why we help them? What makes us different? When they do, take the opportunity to tell them what makes you different. Tell them about the love of Jesus Christ that surpasses all understanding. 
Have you ever watched, it, watched the TV with the t sound turned off? How do you do that? Without explanation, our message has no clarity. But on the flip side, without love, our message has no power. These two things always go together. The preaching of the gospel with our mouths and the demonstration of the gospel with our lives. The preaching gives it clarity, but the generosity gives it power. Also realize that when we do these events and witness to everyone in town, we may not see anything out of it. We might not see anyone get saved or see anyone new come to church, and that's fine. The validity of our witness is not an immediate result. Some will plant, some will water, and some will harvest. As Christians, we are not called to be successful, but to be faithful, doing what we can with what we have, where we are, to advance Christ's kingdom. The la this last week, we had our ministerial association meeting at which it was discussed if we were going to cancel the Thanksgiving dinner and the Christmas baskets and to focus on other things. We discussed pros and cons of both sides and decided to continue with the Christmas or to continue with both this year instead of canceling just a few weeks ahead and letting down the community. To be honest, I was happy about the decision to continue, but for a second, I also wasn't happy. Thanksgiving dinner is something that I've organized the last few years and always during the last week, I stress out because I don't know how many people are actually going to bring food, and I feel like it falls on my shoulders. And this year, we're going to put it together last minute. It'll be held three weeks from today. So for a fleeting second, I thought, I really don't want to do this. It's a lot to have to do in just a few weeks. But then I remembered that I'm not having to organize the event on my own. God is leading me. He will provide for the dinner, and he will give me the rest and assurance I need to be able to pull this together. He will pull it together. So, if you're interested in helping, I ask five things of you. This is a call to action. It's your altar call. One, be prepared when any opportunity to serve arises, just like the virgins who waited anxiously for their opportunity. Two, use your God-given talents to help. If your talent is cooking, then cook. If your talent is serving, then volunteer to serve dinner. If your talent is cleaning, then volunteer to help wash dishes and clean tables. If your talent is going out into the city and country and inviting people to come to our banquet, then go. Invite people. If your talent is that God has granted you with wealth on this earth, but you can't cook, then donate money and we will buy food and find someone to cook it. Whatever your talent is, use it. And on the thing about the money, if you have extra money, give it to Kim so she can send it to the compassion child. Number three, be a sheep, not a goat. Help those in need. Whatever you do for the least of these, you do for Jesus. Number four, accept God's calling. If God calls you to serve at this dinner or asks you to serve in any other aspect in your life, accept the calling. Don't give, don't give God your lame excuses. As we saw in the fourth parable, lame excuses make God furious. And last, and this is me talking now, if you bring a tur turkey to the dinner, please, please make sure it's cooked all the way. We had a couple of the last few years that weren't cooked all the way. They were warm but still frozen on the inside, still bloody. And they went in the garbage because we couldn't risk having someone hand that out and them getting eaten and getting sick. So that's all I have to say. <laughs>